Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here. And uh, moreover, I'm very happy that we have Professor James Bushnell here with us. Um, Professor James Bushnell is professor of economics at the University of California, Davis, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Prior to joining UC Davis, he was the research director of the UC Energy Institute and the Cargill Chair in Energy Economics at Iowa State University. Um, he holds a PhD in operations research from UC Berkeley. Uh, since 2002, Professor Bushnell has served as a member of the Market Surveillance Committee of the California Independent Systems Operator, otherwise known as CAISO. He has also advised the California Air Resources Board in several capacities and has consulted on the design and performance of electricity markets around the US and internationally. I think we'll hear about some of his work in those capacities today. And uh, without further ado, thank you, Professor Bushnell. We're excited about your talk. All right, thank you. Uh, sound OK? Good. Uh, yeah, it's great. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, as you heard, I, I got my degree in operations research. And shortly after um, my PhD, I started migrating over to economics and working with economists from whom I learned that the, the phrase well-trained was to be used synonymously with degree from MIT. Um, <laughs> And so it's, it's great to be here with all these well-trained people. Um, so uh, can electricity markets survive deep decarbonization? Um, some of you, we got a late start. So some of you may have to leave early. I'll give you the quick answer, uh, yes. Um, the longer answer, uh, which is going to be a lot more nuanced, uh, is uh, I, the way I think about it is that I don't see decarbonization fundamentally changing the arguments that I've been part of for the last 10, 20 years in the sense that um, uh, since their inception, restructured, liberalized, deregulated, whatever term you want to use, electricity markets uh, have struggled to find this balance between the right kinds of short-term uh, pricing, particularly under scarce uh, conditions and maybe excess supply conditions, uh, providing uh, market-based incentives to try to improve efficiency, um, balancing that with a need for uh, raising capital for investment, long-term financing for plants uh, on the seller side and on the buyer side, hedging exposure to prices. Um, and then also we have to worry about uh, supplier market power uh, in this mix as well. Um, and a lot of times we've really struggled to try to balance some of these uh, competing goals. Um, and I think we're going to still continue uh, to struggle, but I don't see high, uh, high shares of variable energy resources, uh, renewable generation, fundamentally changing these questions, although it is going to kind of raise the stakes, as we'll talk about, uh, and, and really bring some of these trade-offs into sharper focus. Um, so as I go, um, I, I realize I'm going to end up spending like a third of the talk just defining what I, my terms in my title. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by deep decarbonization here. Generally, we're going to talk a lot about renewable generation of electricity. Uh, and then uh, a surprisingly difficult topic, what do I mean by electricity markets? There are lots of different definitions, so I'll, I'll give you mine. Um, and then I'm going to try to lay the context here. Uh, there, there certainly is some issues about how one finances renewable energy, although um, certainly where I come from in California, that's the least of the issues. There are plenty of contracts out there for, for renewable suppliers. Really, the, the hand-wringing uh, and concern in a lot of parts of the United States right now has to do with the non-renewable generation and how they are uh, doing in wholesale electricity markets and what the implications of high renewable energy are for those types of, of generation. Um, the, it goes under the, the rubric of resiliency of supply at the national level. Um, in California, uh, there is a lot of focus on the question of flexible supply and whether we can keep enough of it around, at least in the transition period, to, to maintain reliability. Um, so I'm going to talk about pricing in, in the short-term markets or the daily markets, um, the potential role or how the idea of capacity markets uh, fits into this. Um, my underlying sort of theme here, a punchline, is that we, we've always really relied upon long-term commercial arrangements between large buyers and large sellers, uh, kind of underpinning the operations of things like markets in ISOs that, uh, that get most of the attention. Um, and we're going to still need to rely upon those types of arrangements. And really, I view questions about capacity markets and related uh, sorts of environments as um, 
what types of long-term contracts and arrangements are we uh, encouraging or incentivizing between buyers and sellers, and how do we get uh, the right amount of those types of arrangements? Okay, so uh, deep decarbonization. What do I mean by this? Uh, back in my part of the country, uh, there's a lot of very ambitious goals. Uh, now, ex-Governor Brown uh, had an executive order to try to promote a zero, I guess this headline implied less than zero, uh, but basically certainly a net zero uh, economy um, by 2045. Um, now, our current air regulator, Mary Nichols, has admitted that we frankly don't know how we're going to get there. Um, and it's interesting, if you Google California 2050 climate goals, the first, first thing that pops up is a picture of Ernie Monet's um, at a, a Stanford conference, basically articulating similar uh, issues about exactly how do we uh, approach a, a deep, deep decarbonization. I get nervous when we talk about things like zero or 100%. Um, they're pretty uh, blunt numbers, um, and we don't quite know exactly where those, the right targets might fall. Um, I'm going to phrase this a little more loosely. I'm basically, uh, the plan in California, at least right now, and, and I've heard versions of this plan in a lot of parts of the world that are pursuing um, really sharp decarbonization, is to basically step one, remove as much CO2 as possible, maybe 100%, uh, from the electric sector. Um, and then transition other sectors like transportation, home heating, commercial heating to electricity. Uh, I realize there are other pathways to doing this and uh, I certainly uh, would be open to, um, to maintaining flexibility in exactly how we pursue this, but this does seem to be the current trajectory that at least California is pursuing. Um, we're pretty far along on step one. Uh, we have been expanding the generation from renewable resources massively this decade. Um, this just represents the different sources of grid scale uh, energy that have been added to the KISO system this decade. There's been a really massive uh, expansion of solar in particular. I'm gonna talk more about the, the ramifications of that as I go. Um, we are at about a third of our energy from, uh, depending on how you count hydro and other things, a third to a half of our energy from renewable resources. Um, there, we're almost certainly going to get to 50% by 2030. Um, there is now a law uh, targeting 100%. Um, I think there's still a lot of flexibility right now on how exactly one defines 100%, so we're not sure exactly what that means, but um, that is, uh, in theory, the long-run target. Um, like I said, I, I get a little nervous about um, trying to pursue, say, 100% versus some other level. And the reason, I'll give you a, a scientific rendering here. Um, conceptually, um, I worry that there is going to be some point where as we're continuing to add renewables to the grid, particularly variable energy resources that are available only when the, when the weather cooperates, that uh, you could imagine during some range it, uh, costs might decline, but at some point the remaining percentages going, and we're not sure exactly where that is, it might be going from 70 to 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 100, but at some point the incremental cost of squeezing out that last 5, 10% of uh, non-renewable energy might raise the overall cost of the system very sharply. Um, and at least economists get nervous about sort of pushing to points where, where those types of, um, of sharp inflection points start to happen um, because you start to think about what the uh, implications are for other parts of the economy. Uh, in particular, if we think about a potential rapid rise in electricity production costs happening at the same time we're, we're hoping to uh, expand the use of electricity to a bunch of other applications, um, we have to think about what the implications are to, for making electricity attractive to those other applications. Um, and some work I've been doing with Severin Borenstein is trying to kind of think about that question and, and where things stand right now, which is how do prices of different energy resources um, from a retail perspective relate to the costs, both environmental and private costs, of supplying those energy resources. So I'm going to show you a couple maps from that. This is still work in progress. But the general idea here is we've been trying to calculate um, the relative retail price that you might pay, you know, the gallons, uh, dollars per gallon at the pump or cents per kilowatt hour if you're an electricity consumer, the variable price you're paying for those types of energy, 
um, compared to the cost of consuming that energy, both the private cost of supplying the actual energy and the environmental costs associated with it. These are actually just air uh, quality costs, and we're using a, a $45 per ton uh, cost of CO2 in here. Um, the, and you can certainly argue with uh, specific number choices here, but the qualitative story is essentially uh, the more blue this map is, the, more, the higher the price you pay for energy relative to the actual cost of that energy, again, including the environmental costs. So in California, the marginal price of electricity is more than double the cost of supplying that energy, um, where the, uh, at least the short-term cost of that energy is quite low, and it's very clean. Um, Relative to, say, gasoline, where everybody complains about how expensive gasoline is in California. I guess they complain about that everywhere. But certainly, uh, it is relatively expensive in California. But compared to the cost of supply and the externalities, the environmental costs associated with it, particularly in places like Los Angeles, the Bay Area, where the local pollutants um, have, have a major impact, uh, gasoline is still underpriced relative to that what economists would call the social marginal cost of the environmental cost plus the private cost. Um, this, is, this is a bit daunting in the sense that we're trying to get people to go from this over to here, but we're already starting at a disadvantage in terms of the relative pricing relative to those costs. And if we continue to push electricity forward first um, by cleaning it up, even though it's already cleaner than the other sources, um, and at the same time, make it more challenging to try to migrate people from other sources, then we have to um, think about what the overall spillover implications are. Um, I have natural gas on here. I don't really have enough time to talk about it. Um, the reason there's a lot of gaps in that map is just uh, it's been harder for us to collect the kind of pricing data that we, uh, that we would like. All right, you might be curious about your part of the world. Um, it's the same story. Hate to break it to you, your electricity prices are high. Um, and your gasoline prices are also high, but it's also dirty. Uh, so uh, again, in uh, the Northeast, you have the same sort of qualitative story that the uh, electricity is overpriced relative to its social marginal cost, whereas gasoline is underpriced relative to it. All right, so that's kind of the where, where I want to go in terms of deep decarbonization. We're thinking about what the implications for the electric sector are of maybe not 100%, but of a large uh, scale up of the amount of zero carbon resources, particularly if they're coming from these variable energy resources. All right, so what do I mean by electricity markets? This is a more complicated question than you might imagine, because there are lots of different dimensions to uh, what might, one might describe as an electricity market. Um, so at one level, uh, a part that I interact with a lot, uh, the independent system operator, there is uh, the availability of transmission, let's call it access, where in a restructured market you have a whole bunch of potential sellers of electricity interacting with a bunch of potential buyers, and they need a platform to reach exchanges um, that doesn't, where their transactions don't necessarily burn out the grid and cause cascading blackouts. Uh, so that's where independent system operators come in. They try to uh, accommodate these kinds of commercial transactions between decentralized buyers and sellers, um, while at the same time maintaining system reliability. And they do this by running uh, things that we call markets. Uh, they have sort of the lingo and trappings of markets. Um, there, and I like to call them balancing markets in the sense that there's a lot of commercial arrangements met in advance of the day ahead and, and, and the day of. Uh, and as those transactions are tweaked and adjusted to real-time system conditions, um, the ISO basically will uh, purchase or sell electricity on the margin to try to make sure that supply is equaling demand in all the right places and at all the right times. Um, like I said, they, they, we use the lingo of markets, but there's really a, just a big optimization program running behind the scenes here that's trying to minimize the cost of operating the system uh, it's not unlike this kind of programs that were run back on the days of regulation. It's just instead of uh, a utility staffer or utility employee's cost number going into the software, it's a bid coming from some kind of supplier or maybe even a consumer. All right, so that's the platform, the ISO. Uh, at the customer-facing level, there's, in some parts of the country and world, retail competition where the 
the company you are personally buying electricity from, you might have choice between different sources of that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really have any time to talk about this in detail. There's some interesting things going on uh, in California with regards to community choice aggregation. Maybe we can come back to that, but um, I'm not gonna have a lot of time to focus on that. So I'm gonna focus mostly on the third component. It's kind of my favorite definition of what electricity uh, restructuring means, and that's really the transformation of how generation resources are compensated. Uh, traditionally, under uh, the regulated, vertically integrated utility, the old utility company model, um, a utility would go out, build the generation and other assets necessary to make sure its customers get reliable supply, um, and then, as long as they didn't screw up too much, uh, the regulator would allow them to recover the cost of those investments plus a rate of return. So uh, use the phrase cost-based compensation. Um, the, the mode in which generation is, uh, is paid is based upon their cost of actually building and operating the plants. Uh, and the restructuring slash deregulation movement really was a, a transition away from this cost-based model to one in which its compensation is based on markets or the market value of the electricity at the time the electricity is produced. Um, I've used the analogy with mixed success over the years of uh, kind of like shifting from renting to owning in the sense that a uh, ratepayer under the old regime owned a little share of the power plant. They basically paid for building, owning, and operating the plant, and what they got out of that was electricity. Um, and as they transitioned to the current model, instead of owning the, the means of production now, they're instead buying the actual commodity coming out of the means of production at a market price. And what's happened over the years is, as you can imagine, just as in housing, uh, the attractiveness of being an owner versus a renter kind of moves with the dynamics of the market. If you have a market with a lot of excess supply, being a renter who can buy off of this glut of supply uh, can look pretty attractive. And in periods when supply is really tight, being an owner actually looks pretty good. And the politics and rhetoric around uh, you know, deregulation versus regulation often move in the cycles of, of whether owning or renting looks like a better or worse deal from one side or the other. All right, so we're gonna think about how this idea of being paid based on a, a market value of the electricity as opposed to cost of construction um, plays out in a world as we're ramping up more and more renewable resources. Um, so just to give you a sense of, uh, of how this looks, this definition applies to the United States, this is now getting to be pretty old, but um, I don't think these numbers have changed dramatically. Um, so the darker red this picture is, the higher the percentage of energy being produced from resources, um, according to the Energy Information Administration, that were classified as non-utility generators, which I'm using as sort of shorthand for they're not compensated under a cost-based model, they're compensated under some kind of deal. It might not look very market-like, but it is some kind of deal reached between a buyer and a seller that's not directly tied to the cost of constructing the power plant. Um, and there's a, actually a pretty nuanced picture here. There are parts of the country we don't normally associate with deregulation um, that have uh, percentages up into the 20s. Um, some of those are deals between a utility and the utility's affiliates, so you, you, you know, market is in air quotes in some places. Um, but the, this part of the country uh, has gone pretty far down that road of uh, generation being largely compensated at market-based prices. A lot of this was transitioned from a utility company to an unregulated or less regulated affiliate of a utility company. Okay, so the national context here. Um, right now, in the last, say, five years, there's been um, a pressure on the sellers of electricity coming from low energy prices, uh, posing serious financial challenges. Um, there's been work out of places like here and, and elsewhere sort of trying to trace the sources of this, basically uh, some combination of low natural gas prices, mostly low natural gas prices, and uh, renewable energy contributing to these low wholesale energy prices. Um, I'm going to correct myself a couple times. There, in, the back of my, in the back of your heads, you need to keep track of the fact that when I talk about prices, most of the time I'm going to be talking about wholesale prices. Um, these are the prices on the ISO markets and are largely linked to what these generation resources are compensated. Um, and then there's going to be retail prices that will come up periodically. Uh, they are not necessarily the same thing. 
So the story, in fact, they're often quite different. Uh, so part of the story here is as wholesale prices have been declining, retail prices have, have actually been rising. Um, and that's been uh, part of the added pressure here. All right, so I'm talking about wholesale prices here. These are low, posing uh, challenges, particularly to base load generation sources like nuclear and coal. Um, the federal government has been, uh, uh, the last few years, uh, trying through a few different avenues to try to come up with ways to, uh, to provide support to what they call uh, the resilient resources that are base load generation resources. Um, at the same time, many states have targeted different types of resources for different reasons. Um, there are several states with aggressive renewable uh, mandates and renewable support policies. Um, there are several states, Illinois, New York, and others, that have supported their nuclear generation through um, certain types of uh, direct intervention. Um, states like Ohio have tried to support their coal resources. Uh, it's still sort of ongoing. Um, so different states have different sets of reasons, and they're all sort of uh, trying to, uh, to support different types of, of resources. The issue from a federal uh, perspective often is that these state-level policies, because these states share pooled electricity markets, um, spill over and affect both prices and, and environmental outcomes in their neighboring states. Uh, so from a federal perspective, where there are laws governing what is fair interstate trade and what is um, reasonable competitive practice, um, they're still struggling with what these types of targeted policies mean for the ideas of what fair, um, fair markets uh, imply. Now, in California, the context is um, specifically on what to do with certain types of generation that the, our system operator, the CAISO, deems as necessary, at least in the near term, for maintaining the reliable operation of our, uh, our regional network. Um, and in, in, we use the term flexibility here, uh, yoga's really big in California, um, that uh, it, the idea is we need resources to try to be very quickly responsive during periods in which the renewable resources are not available. Um, and there is concern that these types of resources are not earning enough out of the market today. And they're, they're also having trouble finding counterparties on the buyer side that are willing to uh, make deals with them, or at least admit that they're, that they're buying power from a gas plant, which is kind of not viewed as, um, as a good look for a California energy company. Um, and therefore, they have periodically threatened to retire their conventional generation resources. There have been interventions um, by the ISO and, uh, and at the regulatory level to try to prevent these types of retirements. And there's still a struggle for exactly how to find enough uh, compensation or if the market is providing enough compensation for these types of plants. All right, so that's all kind of background to what I'm going to uh, focus on here, which is what the implications of this uh, addition of renewable energy means for the dynamics of pricing in these wholesale markets. Um, again, I'm going to think about this is the wholesale level. These are the short-term markets um, at uh, independent system operators. Uh, those of you who've worked in the energy industry like have have seen pictures like this or sort of have them pop up in your head whenever you think of a power market. Um, how many people are familiar with an idea, a graph like this? Yeah, okay, so still half the room. But So the general idea, we call this a generator stack, or you know, economists like to think of it, hey, it's a supply curve, it looks a lot like a supply curve. Um, if you take all the generators in a system and you sort them from the lowest operating cost, marginal cost, to the most expensive, um, the general idea behind operating an electric system at least cost is, when demand is low, you use the cheap stuff first, and then as demand goes up uh, farther and farther, then you bring on the really expensive generation uh, to, try to, to try to keep the lights on, um, but you're using it only when you absolutely have to because it is the most expensive. Now, there are other constraints going on behind the scenes so that moving up and down this curve is not uh, automatically as simple as, as we would hope, but that's the general idea behind this. Um, and the idea behind turning this into a market is sort of the observation that, well, when we intersect the actual level of demand here with the uh, marginal supply, 
Well, that looks a lot like a market, and in, sense, uh, in an economic sense, this is the incremental cost of being able to meet your demand if you flick a light bulb on or charge your electric vehicle, and it's the incremental value that's provided to the system if you are able to generate one more kilowatt hour uh, to this market. So uh, setting the price or rewarding suppliers at this short-term price and charging customers at this short-term price is, uh, in the economic sense, the efficient signal to be sending as to the value of energy at any given point in time. All right, and we're just used to these kind of convex curves where, yeah, sometimes the price is low, sometimes the price is in the middle most of the time, sometimes the price is really high, um, but we're just kind of moving up and down this curve. Now, the, the challenge that a lot of people have in their head when they think of a world with um, large or 100% renewables is, well, renewables has a, a wind and solar has a marginal cost essentially of zero. It's all capital. Uh, and so in a lot of people's minds, they are forming a supply-demand relationship that sort of looks like this, where uh, we're going to just have lots of wind and solar hitting the system, and demand is kind of going to move up and down, but the incremental cost is always going to be zero, and so we're just going to have sort of a zero price on this market all the time. And uh, if we have a zero price on the market, uh, how is any supplier supposed to make any money? How are they supposed to recover any cost towards their capital? Um, now, there are still going to be some issues about recovering costs, but I, I want to push back against this notion, because this is uh, essentially a, uh, th this would be a mistake if we get to a market that looks like this. Because this means that the added value of electricity is zero all the time. Uh, and so that probably means we built too much if we're in a world that looks like this. It almost certainly means that we did. Uh, instead, there's some things missing from a picture like this. All right. Uh, now, you know, uh, people, I, I've run into people who've worked on sort of strategy on the internet, and they sort of think about this as renewables as disruption of the electricity industry akin to, say, how the book publishing industry or the recording industry was disrupted. But the big difference in electricity generation is, uh, you know, Amazon can crank out another ebook for me at zero marginal cost. So there isn't a quantity limit at how many uh, e-books Amazon can make, where there are limits, there are capacity constraints on how much renewable zero-cost generation any given solar or wind unit can produce at any given time. So capacity constraints really matter, um, and that's going to enter into the idea of how prices um, should work. All right, so what's missing from that picture, first and foremost, is this idea of scarcity pricing. Um, when we accept the fact that we can't just produce unlimited renewable energy at zero cost, um, then we have to sort of deal with how uh, we clear this market in periods in which we do not have unlimited capacity. Um, and we do this now. Um, so the general idea is when supply uh, is tight or when just even a specific type of supply is tight, prices are set above that offer price of every generator. So they are earning a price above that incremental cost, and that contributes to their recovery of capital cost. Maybe enough, maybe not enough. That's sort of where the debates are right now. Um, now, I can draw supply and demand pictures. I'm going to show you a simple one in a second. But in actuality, the way this works is through the software. Um, in essence, the software is trying to minimize the cost of meeting everyone's demand, subject to a whole bunch of different considerations, like generators can only ramp so fast, transmission line constraints need to be honored, um, reserve requirements need to be maintained. Uh, and none of these constraints are really 100% rigid. There are engineering standards. We know engineers always like to give a little bit of wiggle room. Um, and so a lot of these constraints we can relax without necessarily threatening um, well, with an incremental impact, not necessarily an automatic blackout. So when I say scarcity, I don't mean we're causing rotating blackouts. What I mean is we're relaxing one of these constraints, a ramping constraint or a transmission constraint, allowing a little, a little more power to go or maybe allowing our reserve margins to drop a little bit. And when that happens in the software, the software has a penalty price associated with it. Anybody who's solved optimization, sort of instead of having a rigid, this constraint has to be met, it can be relaxed. But when it is relaxed, there is a penalty associated with it that keeps the software from doing it lightly. Um, and that penalty price has the effect of basically forming a uh, bonus on top of the uh, offer price of any generator that's operating. 
I wish I could tell you that there's a lot of careful economic thought behind where these uh, penalty prices come from, um, but there isn't. Uh, there are round numbers like $1,000 or $5,000, um, I think motivated as much by computer science guys wanting to make sure that this solves in a quick enough time uh, as it is some notion of the, the economic damages of relaxing this constraint compared to what we think the pricing implications are. And maybe we should give a lot, I, I think we should give more thought to exactly what these penalty prices should be and, and what they actually mean uh, in the long run. All right, in addition, I think one of the reasons maybe people didn't think about it at first is this idea that, well, the demand side is also gonna be part of this story. And so instead of having this just inelastic, perfectly rigid demand, um, we will have people willing to consume less when the price rises really high. Uh, and so these penalty prices won't necessarily matter because people will stop, you know, they'll drop their consumption a bit so that these penalties don't have to be applied. And instead, demand would be setting the price, still be well above the offer price of any generator. Um, you know, we've been talking about this for at least 20 years, maybe 30, 40 years. Um, and there are plenty of examples of it working uh, to a small scale, but still not a... Uh, everyday fundamental part of how markets operate. And increasingly now, we're also gonna have to think about uh, the role of opportunity costs, uh, particularly as storage is part of this picture of high renewable penetration. Um, so the incremental cost of burning fuel, or in this case, the, the money you pay to charge your battery, is not the only cost associated with what you would be willing to sell your charged battery back into the market at. Um, the, there's an opportunity cost to discharging your battery in the sense that if you put electricity out into the grid now, you are unable to do so later, at least until you recharge it again. And so expectations about future prices um, and uh, what you think they will look like are gonna be a big factor in how much you're willing to sell your electricity for in any given hour. Um, and so we wouldn't expect a battery, even if it charges at zero price, to be willing to sell its charge at zero um, in a, in a long-run uh, sort of stable market. All right, so instead of this picture in the back of your minds, um, I, I, would, uh, I, I would propose it's this kind of picture that we're talking about, where uh, we've got a lot of zero marginal cost stuff. It's moving randomly with the uh, weather conditions day and night and so forth. We've got some slope to demand, uh, and we've got some really sharp upward turning parts of the supply curve uh, reflecting both penalty values, opportunity costs, and other stuff like that. All right, so the upshot of this, well, will the price be zero all the time? Um, high renewable penetration, even 100%, does not uh, imply that the price will be zero all the time. Um, what it does mean is that uh, prices should be zero a lot of the time, and they will be really, really high the rest of the time, thousands of dollars per megawatt hour, perhaps. Um, and it's really coming to grips with that sort of implication that, uh, that, we, need to, um, that we need to reconcile ourselves. All right, because this would be the right, you know, uh, short-term price in an economic sense, in the sense that we need these types of prices for the efficient deployment of uh, storage resources, uh, demand side, et cetera, um, although I will, as an aside, say, is part of my world, uh, trying to figure out what the right market power uh, interventions are in a world, particularly with batteries playing a, a big role, is becoming really challenging. Um, I've been at meetings, we're discussing exactly what a fair bid from a battery would be. You know, it's one thing to basically look at a, a gas generator um, and say a $1,000 bid is way above your cost if, uh, if gas prices are low. But when we start talking about a demand side resource and say, I think you'd be willing to curtail your, you know, your demand for less than $500 or you know, you, your battery or your hydro plant, you know, I don't think your expectation of future prices is right. Um, it becomes much more challenging to sort of do that kind of uh, oversight in a world where these types of uh, less, less directly tangible costs are, are playing an important role. All right, um, now the other point I wanna make is we'll probably need this type of price volatility if we wanna you know, get the right types of adjustments and transactions in the short run, um, regardless of how we're financing the capacity in the long run. Um, so if we have capacity markets, um, it doesn't mean we can do away with the need for high scarcity prices, for example. And in fact, in the US, where we do have uh, capacity markets, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we do, in fact, have 
uh, scarcity pricing that does set prices well above uh, the offer prices of specific generators, less high than other places, but I'm, uh, you know, I think there's this interesting question about how, um, how meaningful those differences remain. All right, so let me give you a little bit, this has all been conceptual, I'm gonna do a quick tour through one uh, set of results here. Uh, looking at what's happened in California, I, I showed you that graph earlier of the ramp up of uh, renewable supply. Uh, here is that same uh, expansion translated to uh, an hour of day profile. So the horizontal axis is hours of the day. Uh, the vertical axis is the amount of output from utility scale solar. This isn't counting the rooftop uh, solar. Uh, and it's, it really is a remarkable uh, short, uh, short period of time, massive expansion of energy. So between 2012 and 2016, this is just the average over the course of those two years uh, by hour of day, uh, our average output in the middle of the day went from about half a gigawatt, 500 megawatts, to over six and a half. Um, right now, it's more like 10. Uh, so three years later, this is up to about 10 gigawatts during the middle of the day. Uh, and of course, it's concentrated. It's solar, and it's concentrated when the sun is shining. I, I've been telling people during the day here, one of the, the sort of um, obvious points that became really salient to me during this project is one of the differences between wind and solar is you can put wind turbines in different parts of the country and the wind blows at different times at different, uh, in different places. It turns out the sun only shines during the day uh, in at least North America. And so there's less inherent potential diversity with solar resources than there is with, uh, with wind, which you know, California has, has decided not to avail itself of. Um, now, the wind resources have kind of already been exhausted in that sense, but also um, for various reasons, we have gone sort of all in on solar as our renewable energy of choice this decade. All right, so this has had a noticeable impact on prices. What do you think's happened to prices in the wholesale market from this expansion? They collapse in the middle of the day. Good guess. Yeah, so the blue line represents the, so again, hour of day and wholesale prices um, in 2012 before this massive expansion. And the red line represents the average prices in the uh, day ahead market. That's what the, it's not a, a cuss word, um, that in the CAISO system. Uh, so yes, the cheapest time to buy energy wholesale in California now is 11 a.m. noon. Uh, in fact, we've had all these complicated, it took us 10 years to get time of use pricing through our regulatory process, and by the time they finished, the times were all wrong. Because uh, we used to think, you know, noon is when things were expensive, but now, um, uh, now the really expensive time is about 8, 9 p.m. when people are home, uh, air conditioning is still running, and the sun has set. Um, now, what the intriguing thing from this picture, this is just raw data again, the intriguing thing is if you notice, Prices have gone down a lot in the middle of the day, but they've actually, they, they're higher during the times when the sun isn't shining uh, in 2016. Now, there's a lot of other reasons why that might be the case. This is just raw data, so this paper is basically devoted to going through the checks of, well, what could the other things be controlling for them? And it does turn out that the simple picture actually tells the story pretty well. More solar does actually increase prices during the shoulder periods, as well as decreased prices during the middle period. Uh, and I, I bring this up as part of the earlier discussion to sort of, this is heading down that road of prices that are getting a lot lower some of the time and getting higher uh, short other periods of time. Um, in fact, underneath that higher hour 17, 18 are some $600, $700 prices, bringing that up. All right, and that, that I actually find this comforting. It means the market is kind of working, at least in a qualitative sense, how we would want it to in response to this massive influx of supply that's concentrated in a uh, narrow part of the day. Now, you know, it, it raises questions about whether we, uh, what our policies are that are giving us only that middle of the day supply. Um, but as far as the, the CAISO's market and its response to that, um, it is uh, what we would hope it would be. All right, I mentioned this is wholesale prices now. So the, the people in between this market and my house are retail companies. I, until recently, my provider was Pacific Gas and Electric. 
Um, and they are buying power from these renewable energy sources under long-term contracts, um, largely under mandates from our, uh, our climate policy to rapidly expand the renewable portfolio. Um, and our RPS standards have been successful in building up a lot of renewables very rapidly, but one consequence of that is that the utilities or anybody who has customers is ready to sign a contract with pretty much anybody who has a plausible renewable energy project. Um, and in the early years, those were rather expensive contracts. Prices, as you, I'm, you've no doubt heard, have declined very rapidly, uh, but this period featured some expensive contracts as well. And partly as a consequence, <clears throat> pg e has paid sort of above market prices for long-term contracts that have added more energy to the middle of the day and ended up sort of suppressing the wholesale price on average, although that average, as I said, masks a lot of heterogeneity in time of day. So the black dots here represent the, uh, the wholesale price, and if you imagine a retailer, we don't really want them to do this, but if a retailer just bought off the ISO market every day, um, they tried that in 2000, it didn't work so well, um, that uh, that, that's the prices they would be paying. And they are declining, reflecting the fact that we've been pouring additional capacity on this market, a market that actually already had enough capacity, but because we're trying to replace the existing fossil capacity with new renewables, um, you know, we have a glut of supply, basically, and that has led to lower um, spot prices. But that new capacity is still financed through long-term contracts that have affected their procurement costs, which is represented by the height of the blue portion of this uh, of the bar graphs. So the bar graph represents the price I'm paying on average, um, and pretty much every component has been going up, uh, except taxes, surprisingly, I guess. Um, the distribution and the transmission component has been rising as well, but I guess what I wanna highlight here is the difference between the height of the blue bar and the height of the black dot, which is the gap between the procurement costs, the implied sort of average cost of, that pg e is paying for the energy, um, and the spot value of the energy that it's buying, which is that gap has been growing over time. All right, so the upshot here, um, renewable energy has been added rapidly, uh, largely through long-term contracts between the, uh, in, the, in the industry we use this jargon, load-serving entity, it's somebody who has a customer that consumes electricity. Um, mandates to buy renewable energy are applied to these load-serving entities, and they are out signing contracts to get new renewables built, uh, selling to them. Um, whatever, it's an interesting market dynamic, but if you buy energy under largely a fixed price uh, long-term contract, as a seller of renewable energy, you're just earning that price no matter what the actual value in the ISO is. Um, PG&E and other load-serving entities are sort of the residual claimant on that value. Um, and they don't seem to have focused too much on um, whether they want to buy renewable energy during other times of the day through some other types of projects. Instead, they, they, the dynamic seems to be to focus on just maximizing the number of renewable kilowatts they can get. Uh, and that dynamic has continued. We're continuing to add more solar, um, which is probably going to reinforce this dynamic of depressing the price in the middle of the day. So each additional gigawatt of solar purchased in California has an incrementally lower value than the gigawatt before because they're all sort of putting supply on the market at the same time. So as a result of that, retail prices have crept higher. Um, you know, they've been offset by other trends that, that contribute to lower prices, but overall, um, retail prices have gotten higher, whereas on the CAISO level, um, prices are lower on average, but higher during some periods of the time, which I would argue is the right response to the facts on the ground of having lots of solar. And one implication of that, back to sort of what the California context uh, would be, is if you're a flexible generator that is able to generate maybe twice a day for a couple hours in the morning and the evening, um, this at least qualitative pattern in prices uh, is better news for you than if you're, say, a nuclear plant that's just running all the time. Lower average prices are just bad news for a baseload generation plant but a plant that can take advantage of those short-term price spikes uh, is in a better position. All right, so the, the peaking plants, uh, the flexible generators in this market, um, 
they are, the, their relatively higher value to the market is reflected in the market pricing, although there's a big debate going on now. Okay, they're earning more. In fact, what we document in the paper is they're, earn, they're getting hurt less <laughs> than other types of generation. If you're flexible, you've lost a little bit of money from this renewables revolution, but a lot less than if you were a baseload power plant. So is it enough to stay in business and keep around to recover your ongoing fixed and, and capital needs? All right, and that's where uh, the question of how we finance investment uh, comes into this picture. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about capacity markets, but I, I'd intended to spend most of my time and then I realized, I thought initially I had 75 minutes and then I read my email more closely. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk quickly about it. Um, so one of the interesting facts that people like Paul Joskow have documented over the years is if you look at um, the amount of money available to a generator, if, if they were essentially selling into a short-term market, if you built a generator with your own money and all you did was sell into a CAISO or other types of ISO markets every hour, um, which almost nobody has done, although a couple, couple companies tried and it didn't go well for them, um, you would have, it turns out, not made enough money out of those short-term markets to cover what we think is the reasonable uh, sort of all-in cost of owning and operating a plant. Uh, so this has sometimes been referred to as the missing money, this odd gap between the, the value signaled by these short-term markets and the cost of actually owning and operating a plant. Um, and the existence of this missing money, which is pretty persistent in, in all parts of the US at least, um, is, is often referenced as, uh, as evidence that need, there needs to be some other money. Missing money implies there's other money needed. Um, I should say, missing money is a somewhat flexible term. In my experience, it, it, with stakeholders, it means money they are not getting. Um, and so depending on who you're talking to, it has a different definition. Um, I'll define it here as the, this gap between the, the prices in the short-term markets and, and what people estimate the needs for new uh, investment or ongoing investment would be. Um, and so this has often been cited as a need for uh, capacity payments or other side of payment. Um, now, I don't necessarily disagree with any of this, but I do want to sort of um, push back on the notion that capacity markets are even more necessary in this high renewable world or that they're, they're the answer um, that's a simple way because capacity markets themselves um, face challenges in this uh, high renewable world that, um, that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. And I do want to point out a couple facts here. So money has been missing for a long time in all of these markets. Um, and yet we've kept building power plants in all these different markets. Uh, and so this is um, just, again, from the EIA, uh, additions of capacity. The stories vary. You know, we have different types of markets in the United States. The blue is the old school regulation cost of service. Um, we have some markets that, that pay for capacity through a centralized market, some that pay through another type of mechanism, some that don't pay for capacity at all. Uh, others have sort of gone back and forth. Um, and they've all added capacity of one stripe or another over the years for different reasons. Um, so it's not a necessary condition for investment. Um, it might lead to better investment. That's really hard to, to try to tease out. Um, so the point here is that there's something else going on that's driving investment that's unrelated to the short-term energy prices. And there's a lot of different things that have continually buffeted this market. So there is this long-term procurement dynamic between large buyers and large sellers, which we hope is based upon market expectations, but there's a lot of other influences playing in, including regulatory mandates to build more renewable power plants, for example. There's also vertical integration, where companies are focused more on what uh, their retail sales are than necessarily the, uh, the, sh the ISO markets. There are periodic interventions into markets where if an, uh, an ISO gets worried there's not enough capacity, they'll just make sure capacity gets added through uh, what we'll call backstop mechanisms. So through one way or another, we've been able to add capacity under pretty much every type of uh, market structure we can think of. Uh, and one of, the, one of the problems this poses um, is when we want to think about what the missing money means then. Well, all this investment both causes missing money and is impacted by the missing money. And it's really hard to sort of tease out then what conclusions um, we can make from, uh, from that measurement of it. 
Um, and I, I look at different markets. I was trying to sort of look at prices can go high in all parts of the country. They can certainly go higher in places like Texas. But if you look at the average prices in all these places, they don't seem to be sufficient to recover costs. At least if, that, if all they were doing was, was buying off and selling into the short-term markets, there would be problems that there are other things going on. One of those other things is what we will call a capacity market. Um, and I, I'm going to use that term a little more loosely than, uh, than a rigorous definition would apply. But um, it's essentially a way of compensating generation in addition for the generation being paid for that energy they're selling at those kinds of prices I've been showing you pictures of. Um, they are usually mandated uh, by some kind of market operator or regulator. Uh, anybody who is a load serving entity who has customers who use electricity is required to uh, make a payment to the suppliers uh, based upon some estimate of what their peak demand would be either next year or multiple years into the future. Um, and the idea is this, is this would supplement the money that's missing from the short-term markets to ensure that there's enough revenues to uh, both build and maintain capacity at levels necessary to meet these dem peak demand conditions. So there's a bunch of different ways you get to this point. California, instead of having a, a single market, it has a, uh, a requirement, a mandate. If you sell electricity to a customer in California, um, you have to go out and buy capacity. Just like if you have a car, you have to go buy liability insurance. So it's a, a purchase mandate of that kind. Um, and there's a regulator that does checkups to make sure that you've bought capacity uh, of, of a kind they approve of. Um, other parts, like the New England here, has a centralized capacity market, which um, essentially the ISO goes out and buys capacity for everyone, um, and then will allocate costs for, uh, for that capacity based upon the actual peak uh, consumption. It, this latter model works better in places where the capacity is purchased far in advance. In New England, it's three years, is, is, is that, uh, and because it's easier to forecast total system demand three years out than it is the demand of one specific uh, load-serving entity. All right, so there are different ways. Uh, there's also a lot of different types of contracts that this, this constitutes. So I'm going to basically say, th describe, or think of this as, this is a sort of uh, a requirement to every load-serving entity that they sign a long-term contract of a certain kind. Um, and you can think of it as a way to hedge their supply risk. But it's really kind of a very weak sort of hedge. It doesn't really... Um, provide any kind of insurance against high prices. Um, and this comes back to the question that, that we've struggled with for about 15 years, particularly with capacity markets, is when you buy capacity, what is it you're actually getting? Uh, or conversely, if you sell capacity as a generator, what is it you actually have to do? Um, originally, you would just sort of have to build a power plant that could plausibly generate electricity and then your obligations were more or less done. Um, in California now, if you build capacity, you are obligated to bid it into the market every day uh, if you sold capacity, but you could bid it in at a price of $1,000 a megawatt hour uh, if you wanted to, um, unless you're subject to some types of mitigation. Um, and so it's not necessarily a, a, a mitigation against high prices, but it is uh, insurance against there being enough physical capacity. Um, but as we're sort of approaching a new world where we have all sorts of different types of capacity, uh, we're struggling with how to think about how to compare a gas turbine to a wind plant to a battery in terms of the types. What is a megawatt capacity of a gas plant? How does that compare to a megawatt of wind, solar, batteries? Uh, and how does that filter through these types of mechanisms? All right. so. Um, I, I, I was part of a project that sort of tried to look at what this means for capacity markets a few years ago. Uh, we wrote it for the DOE right before the election, and it went out with everybody else at DOE, I think. Um, so uh, what, what we saw was that there are, there's real sort of stresses hitting the traditional model of capacity markets here that are being challenged uh, by several factors. The biggest is this influx of alternative resources. So for example, in California, the resource adequacy requirement, or the capacity requirement, um, is being met increasingly by solar plants. 
All right, so the reliable supply that is procured under a capacity mechanism is being uh, provided by solar. Um, and so that's raised this question of how do you compare a megawatt of solar capacity to a megawatt of wind to a megawatt of a gas turbine? Um, and in places like New England and the upper Midwest, the challenge has been, well, even if you buy, you may think of gas turbines as more reliable because they're not reliant on the wind, but it turns out if it's really cold, it's really hard to get gas. Um, so there have been periods in, in New England particularly where gas has been really hard to get, and gas plants that have sold capacity, they have very reliable physical capacity there, don't have any fuel. Um, and so their ability to provide reliable electricity was pretty much um, curtailed by the fact that they didn't have fuel. And you know, there's a lot of finger pointing about whose fault that was. Um, so on both the, re the renewable side and on the gas turbine side, there's been this question of if you sell capacity, what kind of obligation do you have to actually generate electricity with that capacity? Uh, and I'll frame that question as, do we think about capacity as an on-demand product, which basically says, if I'm a buyer and I bought capacity from you, and I really need it, you better damn well produce it. Um, and that's sort of the direction that ISO New England has gone. Um, or is it an on average product where, hey, you know, you're a wind turbine. I can look at your historical production, and I know that on average, you know, if you build a, a megawatt of wind, you're going to be producing 0.65 during the hours that I usually need it. Um, and so we'll reward you for that historical performance. Uh, and markets have kind of gone back and forth. Um, you can imagine different sides of this debate sort of favor different interpretations. Um, in New England and in uh, the Midwest, the on-demand sort of model has, has taken shape in the form of a really sharp penalty for not producing from your power plant if you sold capacity and uh, a certain type of emergency condition is in effect then you better be generating or else you pay $5,000 a megawatt hour in penalties, $10,000 a megawatt hour, a very large number um, that makes it both riskier to sell capacity if you're worried that you're going to be available, but also really focuses performance incentives on hours of, of severe supply. Um, California's resisted this model, uh, and one of the things I've been interested in is trying to figure out, it's, it's a new thing, and, and I, I, um, I would have expected renewable resources to just drop out of this market altogether once this big performance penalty was put into place, but that doesn't seem to have been the case, that uh, the percentage of renewable generation selling capacity in both PJM and, and New England hasn't notably declined. Yeah, so I, I think they have some other types of arrangements to try to hedge those risks. All right, so we've got state support for these specific generation resources um, that's having the effect, either intentionally or unintentionally, of depressing capacity prices. Um, and that's forced regulators to intervene and say, well, we think your support for these state resources has probably led to too low prices, and therefore we're going to make you bid higher, um, and that's led to some, some issues. And then lastly, we've got a lot of new technology um, that could probably help reconcile our notions of what reliable supply should be um, with, between the economists and the engineering concepts. Our, our reliability requirements are still kind of rather crude um, engineering uh, standards um, that don't really translate to notions of what the economic costs of interruption might be. Um, we do have the capability of trying to merge that, but um, I'm not sure that our regulatory structure allows it. All right, so um, just to summarize, the, a couple points that I wanted you to take away with is you shouldn't expect prices to be zero all the time. What you should expect are more extreme prices. Um, and uh, I think efficient operation of the short-term market really requires that, and so um, hopefully we can reconcile our climate goals with what that implies for operations and markets. And evidence from existing markets does seem to bear out this qualitative shift. Um, and the trend is to, for allowing higher and higher scarcity prices. Um, so the big issue in power markets for as long as I've been working in them has always been we need long-term financial arrangements between buyers and sellers. Um, 
they're still really necessary. They're probably even more necessary. Um, I don't think that capacity instruments are necessarily the sole type of long-term arrangement that solves that problem, though. I think where the capacity question goes is, are capacity instruments need, going to need to be strengthened so that they, by themselves, are sufficient to finance generation uh, and hedge load, or are they meant to be a complement to other types of long-term contracts? And that led, leads to the question of whether a capacity requirement crowds out other types of long-term procurement. Um, or it complements it, um, which I realize I've gone too long, so I'm going to stop there uh, and happy to take questions for those of you who, who can stay. So thank you. I should add these comments are drawn from a bunch of different papers. Those, the, just the references will be available online in case you wanted to look more. So I just listened to an hour's talk by a very well-trained, clearly knowledgeable person, and it made me wonder, should we have d electricity deregulation? When my phone was deregulated, my prices got much lower, my reliability got very slightly worse. My electricity has been deregulated for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. I haven't noticed any improvement in the gross national happiness. We have a lot of people like you who try to juggle the markets to make them work. 20 years ago, we had Enron who juggled the markets to make it work for Enron for a while. And are deregulated electricity markets really of any benefit to the nation compared to the old regulatory system? Yeah, so I can make the case that, that yes, they have in, in certain parts of the country. Uh, and some of, the, some of the work here has sort of outlined that the, the process of, of restructuring in a lot of parts of the country ended up being a bet on the natural gas price over the last decade. Uh, and in places, so during the periods where natural gas prices went up, um, places that deregulated ended up paying increasingly high prices. But since 2008, um, places that have restructured have experienced prices that have risen much more slowly than places that remained regulated. California is a bit of an outlier because of uh, you know, the crisis and some other things there. Um, there's been a lot of bottom-up sort of focused studies on what the implications of, of uh, let's call it deregulation have been. Um, the nuclear power fleet's operation has improved massively as a result of that. Not enough to keep those plants, some of those plants around apparently. Um, the, uh, the efficiency of other types of power plants has improved. Um, but, you know, you, the, the retail customer um, outcomes have been very mixed, it's true. But part of that is that, you know, retail prices have been much more tied to other commodities that sort of move. Uh, when you have a deregulated market, the prices are going to be much more responsive to whatever that price setting type of fuel would be. And in that case, it's been natural gas in this country. And when natural gas is high, deregulation has been bad. The last few years, actually, deregulation has been pretty good um, because those wholesale prices have been lower, and that has been more directly passed through in, in the more deregulated markets than, the, than the, the less deregulated markets. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, now that 50% uh, of the California population is on community choice aggregation, how's that affecting the long-term financial arrangements or contracting arrangements for the utilities? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a real, it's, it's maybe the second California, oh, I, I'm being taped. Um, okay, so um, I, I really, really worry about it because one of, the, one of the stylized facts, I've been trying to get more hard information about this, is that the, the CCAs, these are small community retailers that um, I guess they have in, in Massachusetts as well. The, yeah, the, they, they first of all don't have strong credit initially um, and that restricts their ability to sign long-term contracts. And secondly, um, they have been focused on providing you know, 100% renewables and stuff like that. So what that means is the contracts they are signing have been with those solar plants that are generated during the middle of the day. And the net result is they are pretty much buying off the spot market when the sun isn't shining. Um, or they're buying on contracts that are indexed to market prices. 
Uh, at the same time, we've been seeing little hints of increased market power in California uh, starting to creep in as well. And I don't think those two things are necessarily unrelated. Um, so I do really worry that we, uh, that, and it's not, I, I, I think the advent of CCAs could be a good thing in the sense that we had kind of a monolithic single uh, regulatory agencies for directing procurement and to the extent injecting different ideas into that, there, there's an argument that there's a benefit there. But the short run, cons I've got some skeptics in the front row, um, that you know, the short run consequence has been that there's been a, a real shift to short run procurement that, that I do worry uh, for a bunch of different reasons is, is, is leaving the market much more exposed to short run prices. Um, I, another weird dynamic is because every retailer is sort of promoting high renewables as a retail product, you know, they're willing to buy renewables, but no one's willing to admit that they're buying from a gas plant. Um, and so purchases from gas plants are coming from kind of more generic system uh, kind of contracts pegged to market prices rather than any kind of long-term contract with a, with a gas generator. So it's sort of a built upon this discussion about CCA. Um, and also, one of your slides mentioned about the retail rate in comparison with the blue-colored uh, energy procurement. With that increasing disparity, it makes the case for perhaps more of a CCA type and maybe even more aggressively for behind-meter edge technologies, transactive energies, and things of that sort happening at the retail level. Well, so, so I, I would agree, but I don't think that's necessarily a good thing uh, because the pressure then for CCAs to the extent that um, you know, a CCA can go by at that black dot. Um, but the blue bar, that's a, that's a 20 year contract PG&E signed. And so when my CCA, when I leave PG&E to go to a CCA, I'm leaving PG&E with that contract. Uh, and and that's not, that's not, it doesn't go away. So uh, the structures that have been put in place to deal with that inequity of, of customers who are left behind is to have an exit fee associated with migrating to a CCA, where I still pay a share of that blue bar even though I'm now uh, a customer of YOLO clean energy. I guess my qu question is perhaps along this line of saying that if you imagine maybe a little bit longer term, say 20, 30 years down the road, mm -hmm. when the edge technologies, behind meter technologies become really cost competitive, there are many, many transactive activities happening, maybe not even being accounted for by the utility companies. How are we even think about this whole capacity or planning problem when you have lots of uh, uh, retail level transactions. Well, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just say that if, if behind the meter technologies become cost competitive, that would be great, but they should be paid the black dot. So the problem is, is when you're behind the meter, you're implicitly avoiding all of this, including the grid costs, now it's gonna be California wildfire liability payments, and those are costs that don't go away when you generate you know, distributed energy. Um, and so I'm all for you know, having that kind of technology compete, but right now there's a very strong implicit subsidy of those types of technologies because the rates in California are all variable and all of those other fixed costs are lumped in and they're avoided being paid for by, uh, by the distributed generation. So if I could ask you about uh, the East and these markets where we've got capacity rules, capacity market rules have changed to put penalties on underperformance, on uh, performance hours. You said you thought uh, renewable energy would be withdrawing from the market. Haven't seen much of that. Is this really a problem that there's not enough performance hours, there's an oversupply actually? We just have those renewable generators riding a wave of oversupply. But you think there's a hedge going on? I, I don't know. I, I, I started trying to dig up data on this for this talk. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the very first year of the performance capacity in New England, to my knowledge. Uh, PJM's had a few more years of it. I mean, they bought it three years ago, but this is the first year it's been in effect. Um, and so uh, what I've been able to, to dig out is who's selling it um, to some degree. But uh, I, I don't think we've had enough data yet to know exactly how, how it's impacting actual operations. I, I personally think it makes sense. It's sort of merging some of the energy incentives that high energy prices are meant to provide um, in, into a capacity market model. Um, I know that 
there are some sellers that don't like taking on that liability risk, but it seems like it's an appropriate level of risk in the sense that well, if, if what you're trying to buy is, as a, as a buyer capacity, is actual reliable capacity. Uh, and so it's, it comes closer to an energy sort of mechanism in that sense. But I, yeah, I, I think we should all be paying more attention to how well it's working. Hi. Um, yeah, I had one question. You, uh, I saw the graph, um, you know, between uh, 2012 and 2016, uh, um, and with the influence of like PV in California, I was wondering, like, at the end of the day, are people in California paying more or less uh, for the electricity they're getting? If you take into account like justice for like price commodity and inflation, um, and by are they paying more? I'm like wondering like what is like is the weighted like average of the electricity going up or going down between those two dates, 2012 and 2016, 15, uh, 16, yeah. Right. So and and that basically that that kind of thing is being picked up here. So the. The average price between the hours that went up and the hours that go down does average out to a little bit lower. So you can see the black dots here basically reflect the, the, the yearly average of all those hours. And they are declining somewhat. But the price I pay has been going up because those, basically those renewable plants are not being paid that price. They're being paid a contract price that is being entered into because the load serving entities need to sign those contracts to comply with the renewable mandates that they are, uh, that they are subject to. So they're willing to pay above market prices in order to meet their renewable requirements. And then you get the blue bar here. Okay. So the blue bar is what PG&E is paying for energy. Uh, that's my retailer. They pay sellers of energy through contracts and other things. They're, my bill breaks out the sources of cost. They're paying the, the height of the blue bar, and the value of that energy on the wholesale market is the black dot. And so the gap between what PG&E is paying to buy energy and that, and that wholesale value has been, has been getting larger over time. Hi, Professor Bushnell. Thank you for the talk over here on, the, on your right. Yeah. Um, I really appreciated your simple mental model of kind of low prices most of the time with some high prices uh, or very high prices some of the time. But uh, I think you also noted that those high prices have not been particularly popular among regulators and, and uh, other interveners in the industry. And so kind of as you think about moving forward uh, into, these, into a market where you have much higher penetrations of renewables, mm -hmm. Can you maybe pontificate on what types of structures uh, might work in this world if you do have these kind of constrained energy prices that we have, or constrained scarcity prices that we've seen in, in most of our uh, organized markets outside of you know ERCOT and, and Australia? Right, but okay, so, and this is one of the things, um, I, I, scarcity prices, even in markets you know, without, that aren't called energy only markets, have been relaxed and have been rising uh, quite a bit over this decade and, and continue to sort of, uh, there, there, are, there are definitely issues with operators that are worried about reliability and sort of maybe unintentionally take actions that, that lower prices and all sorts of other things. But we've seen prices in the multiple thousands of dollars in every one of these markets. So mechanically, there's nothing preventing it. I think there's, a, there's an endogenous sort of amount of capacity that is, uh, is enough that we're not hitting those scarcity levels um, with uh, maybe a high enough frequency, depending on what you consider the right amount of frequency. But I'm not sure that the design itself, I don't know whether 2,000 is enough or 5,000 is enough. Um, and part of it depends upon how often we hit those levels, for example. Um, but there's, you know, we have had $5,000 prices in California if you get enough of these penalties sort of pancaking on each other. Um, so mechanically, there's nothing actually preventing it. And, you know, politically, no one's noticed actually, but that's because it's been for five minutes and it hasn't really affected energy prices and the utilities have been fully hedged. Um, so maybe if, back to the earlier discussion, if we do have a, a large amount of it. Um, but we are in a trend where right now the market designs are emphasizing more uh, frequent and higher scarcity prices. 
Um, yeah, thank you for this talk. Um, so I have a question about energy storage and specifically how energy storage is and will impact capacity markets. And then also your recommendations for um, changes regulatory con to regulatory constructs that could incorporate the um, ability for energy storage to provide increased reliability. Um, okay, so one of the, I'm glad you asked about storage because I had one slide that I brought just in case. Um, so you would think storage is great for dealing with these kind of short risk, particularly batteries. Um, the California uh, experience with batteries so far has been that they haven't been engaging in, in this kind of energy arbitrage of buying low, selling high that I think a lot of people were hoping they would. Instead, they're choosing to basically maintain charge at a steady level and, and serve kind of short run fluctuations, which, which saves the battery, basically. And so there's an economic sense to this. But it appears that the cost of being able to use at least a, a you know, kind of conventional battery technologies to do daily shifts of energy from uh, peak to trough um, could be more expensive than what people really um, thought based on the, the opportunity cost of burning up the battery life and having to replace that. Um, I think as far as the capacity goes, that's a really tough question. And I think there have been two schools of thought. And California's going in one direction, um, New England the other. So New England has taken a more kind of technology neutral stance that basically says, we don't care, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating it a bit, but do whatever technology you want, but make sure you're generating during these emergency situations or else penalty. Um, the other approach that California's sort of taking is to slice the capacity requirement more and more finely. So we had a capacity requirement, but it turned out it was being met with all renewable energy. And so they had to make a second capacity requirement to catch the stuff that got sort of crowded out of the first capacity market. So we now have a flexible capacity requirement. But that led to a huge debate over, you know, I think implicitly it was kind of like, we want to have a gas requirement, but they could say it was a gas requirement, so they needed to define what flexibility meant. And storage became a big part of that. It's how do you compare a five minute uh, ability to do five minute um, charge, discharge, but maybe multiple times a day with the ability to do a three hour discharge but only once a day. Um, and the hydro people and the battery people have gotten into big fights about that. We still haven't fully resolved it. Um, and this is one of the things I think that, that's a real challenge for capacity markets is um, the definition of what capacity is is becoming less and less clear as we have all these sorts of different technologies. And I think storage is at the forefront of that. Because even within the storage class, there are very different types of storage with very different types of capabilities. And that's why the appeal of, of sort of the, the New England model, which is less um, technology dictating and more sort of results oriented, um, is appealing in the sense that different, different technologies can sort of approach this, but they need to perform. It's, it's identifying it more from what do we want our technologies to do, rather than how exact, which technology we specifically want to do those things. I've raised it a couple times, and there has not been a lot of enthusiasm. Um, but I do think that's, that's part of the reason why I want to um, sort of compile more evidence about exactly how, how it's working. Um, to, try to, to try to maybe raise that case again. Um, I should also add, California has just a, a, a storage mandate that's, that's equivalent to a renewable portfolio standard. So every load serving entity has to buy a certain amount of storage. Um, and so that's, that's adding storage to the network, uh, to the market outside of any of these other sorts of mechanisms. Are there any sort of lessons learned from global markets where you might have a lot of hydro, like in Canada or Brazil, or a lot of nuclear, like in France, where you end up having a market like this, which is essentially zero marginal cost for a long time, and then these peaky points where you really need more supply? Well, I think the lesson from hydro markets is it's, it's sure, life is sure easier when you have a lot of hydro. Um, and, and market design becomes a lot easier, um, except when there's a drought, actually. And so the, the, that's, that's also been a, sort of a challenge in places like Brazil, where um, you know, most of the time, the things are, instead of prices sort of being like this from day to day, it's more they're like this from year to year, and then every 
10 years there's a drought and prices are just high all the time in, in the hydro-based markets. So again, it's not zero because there's this opportunity cost and there's a scarcity component because when you have hydro, if I let the water go through the dam today, I can't use it tomorrow. And there's an implicit value and opportunity cost associated with that that's factored in. Now, when there's a lot of water, uh, that opportunity cost can kind of drop to zero. And so periodically, when, when it's really wet, it will do that. But um, in general, what you see in hydro systems is the price is, is pretty stable from day to day, but will have these big swings um, hour to hour. And, and those markets have really faced a challenge because their capacity instruments, what they really need is some gas or something to be around once every 10 years you know, when, um, when, when there isn't enough rain. And, and that's, that's been a more challenging way to uh, try to implement. Uh, people have approached that. Uh, Frank Wallach has done some stuff trying to uh, in push a, a kind of energy contracting mandate in those kind of circumstances. France, I know less about. I mean, I, I, you know, people in the nuclear industry, there's a lot of, <laughs> I hear a lot of opinions about what the actual marginal cost of a nuclear generator is in terms, well, in terms of sort of actual annual costs. And, and so, um, those systems, I'm not sure France counts as a market either. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I'm in a good position to, to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, um, over here. Um, there's a bipartisan bill in Congress called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And it would put a $15 per ton uh, fee on coal, oil, and natural gas and increase at $10 per ton every year thereafter. And I'm just wondering if that type of a policy would change anything that you had to say today. Um, no, I think it, you know, one of, the, one of the things I didn't get a chance to emphasize is what I've been talking about today is more um, how electricity markets react to climate policy. Um, I do think that we shouldn't use our electricity markets to implement climate policy by, say, you know, favoring the dispatch of one type of energy over another through a non-market kind of preference. But um, I, there, there are, the short-term markets are, are well positioned to sort of capture, for example, carbon pricing. They do it in California. They do it in Reggie, but, you know, for what it's worth. Um, and, uh, and I, I, you know, I think the results would be predictable in the sense that you would see uh, higher marginal prices in the short run. Um, and I think in the long run, you'd end up in a similar sort of circumstance where it depends on what that marginal technology is. Um, if it truly is everything zero carbon on the electricity network, then it is true that carbon pricing wouldn't necessarily raise prices anymore. But that's because reducing electricity com consumption would not, or increasing electricity consumption would not create any more carbon. Um, and so there being no carbon price in that circumstance would actually be reflective of the circumstance. But I, I suspect where we're going to end up is with some role for traditional generation for quite some time to meet you know, these, um, these peak periods. Uh, carbon pricing would add to those prices during that period, increase the returns for low carbon resources. Um, in the interim, I think you know, the problem of I, I worry about nuclear plants retiring. Um, the question of whether they should retire or not if we had a real carbon price is hard to answer, um, but we would know the answer if we had a real carbon price. Um, 15 is a little low by my sort of guesstimation, but it certainly might be enough, actually. I, I'm not sure where you guys, where the experts, the well-trained people here have come out on that. Um, but one, you know, I'm sure one of the perverse things that, that people have noticed is by, by layering all the zero carbon uh, renewables onto the network, it has lowered the average energy price and it has made life harder for a baseload nuclear power plant, which is also zero carbon. Um, and so if, if renewables are being supported solely as a carbon policy, there is this kind of perverse uh, counterproductive uh, result, potential result there. You know, is it enough to be causing the retirements is sort of an open question. But if we were doing it through carbon pricing, I think we would know the answer to that. Uh, thank, thanks again for being here. I'm up here. Um, I uh, had a question uh, regarding Casper in uh, New England. So with uh, Casper, it, it looks like it's going to be fairly difficult for sponsored resources to gain access to the capacity market at all. Um, and what that uh, seems to, to be likely to result in is a lot of capacity laying outside the capacity market but being procured on state mandates anyway. 
Does that create any challenges for capacity markets uh, or the system overall? Um, you stump me. I, I'm not. I, I, we should talk afterwards because I'm not uh, enough up to speed on that interaction to to um, to speculate. I well, from what I understand about the Moper, what one thing I definitely worry about is if if we got capacity that's there. We don't necessarily want to build more capacity and pretend that the capacity that's already there isn't there. Um, that there's, there should be some other way to try to deal with that. I think the, the only justification for a Moper-like solution would be as if it's an actual deterrence to the subsidies that, um, that are being put in place. But I think the subsidies, to the extent they're motivated by non-market um, uh, motivations are. Yeah. All right, there's the, like, Last question, I think. Yeah. Last question. So thank you for the presentation. So you actually, during the talk, uh, differ about uh, engaging more the demand side, and everything was more focused on the supply. So what kind of mechanisms do you think that we can use in order to start uh, engaging more actively the demand side? Um, well, I think the, the most important sort of first step is to uh, reform retail rate structures so that all these fixed costs aren't part of them. Um, I do know that you know right now batteries have a strong incentive to go behind the meter um, to avoid certain types of fixed charges, and that actually makes them less inclined to participate in the wholesale market because the, the everything the wholesale market does is is fudged up by 15, 20 cents a kilowatt hour by all those fixed costs. So I think a, a transition to more of a larger monthly fixed charge and a short-term price that is much more. Uh, a better aligned to the wholesale market price would be like a really important first step. And then, you know, we can have debates about what the right type of dynamic price would be. There are all sorts of, of good ideas floating around, and, and most of them have had pilot programs that have been reasonably um, successful. Uh, but I, I do think what's interesting is in markets with retail competition, it seems like you talk to retail providers, they say, nobody wants to buy this sort of dynamic pricing product. Um, and so there does seem to be, they believe there's a lot of customer, that it's not real appealing to customers. Um, and so I, that's an interesting thing to try to, now, you know, maybe they have, if, if prices start to take the types of extremes we've been talking about, that, that could certainly change, especially if we're talking about, hey, zero prices during 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, that, could, that could get people's attention. Um, but it won't help, the zero energy price won't help if they're also paying 15 cents a kilowatt hour for the transmission um, during the same, same time. All right, I've kept everybody like a half hour late, so thanks for sticking around. Thank you.